Hello, I'm Professor Shane Dirk, the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, and welcome to our series of lectures on drugs in the body. Now today we're going to be looking at the opioids. Now the opioids are one of the major clinical issues worldwide and include a range of synthetic and natural products. Uh, they've been associated with serious uh, psychosocial harms across the world. But before we go into the sorts of harms I'm referring to, let's first look at what the opioids are. They're CNS depressants, that is their central nervous system depressants that include the natural products of the opium poppy and the synthetic compounds derived from it. These days the term is usually uh, covers both things such as opium and methadone, other types of opioids, it covers all of them. They're agonists for the uh, opioid receptors in the brain, primarily the mu receptor. Why do people take them? Well, they have euphoric effects, sedative effects and sleepiness. People take them primarily for euphoria they, in, in, when, when I say take them, I'm saying take for recreational purposes, which is mainly what we're concerned of up here. Uh, and the euphoria uh, can be accelerated uh, by the writ of administration, for instance, injecting, and people who use these drugs refer to the rush. Now, they have a number of physical effects because, as you would well be aware, they are used in medical practice and they're an essential medicine. They constitute a class of essential medicines. They're used for pain relief, analgesia. They are also uh, have, they have a long history as such and in fact drugs such as heroin were used for this uh, before uh, other drugs replaced it because of its high dependence liability. They cause a suppression of the cough uh, reflex, which as you may not be aware, uh, heroin was sold on the market uh, in the late part of last century as a cough um, suppressant. They cause respiratory depression. Now this is a central nervous system effect. They cause the, the brain essentially to forget to tell the body to breathe. Also, and I talked about the reduced uh, coughing, related to that, they're actually an emetic, that is they induce vomiting. Now I'll, I'll come back to this, but those two things together are, are significant. Uh, one of the signs, the cardinal signs of opioid use is pupil um, constriction, that is pinpoint pupils. Now why are these drugs of such interest? Well. One, they're widely used, but two, they have an incredibly high dependence potential. It's estimated for heroin that something like one in four people that use heroin once go on to develop heroin dependence. The only drug we know that's more uh, likely to induce dependence than that is nicotine. There's a high risk of dependence, and I should say that this dependence tends to be chronic well, the thing that stands out from heroin dependence is its chronicity, that people go through periods of use and relapse and this can go on for decades. It's something that we, people, we can treat, but realistically a dependent opioid user is, look, it is typically looking at a long period of dependence. And high mortality rates. Uh, we find that users of the illicit opioids, such as heroin, die at something 15 times the rate of other uh, people in the population. And I should point out that people also use illicit uh, drugs, uh, which are pharmaceutical opioids, and these are also uh, associated with a higher risk of death. All right, we've talked about the opioids what do I mean? What are the main drugs here? Well, the first one that's been the most prominent of greatest clinical significance is heroin. 
Heroin is diacetylmorphine. It's actually a prodrug. You don't find heroin in the blood. It's rapidly synthesized uh, into morphine. Uh, it's, the drug is synthesized from opioid, comes in a number of different forms, white powder, uh, brown powder, black tar. White powder typically from Asia, Southeast Asia is seen in countries such as Austra in Australia and Australasia generally, the United States. The uh, brown powder, much more amenable to smoking, comes from the Middle East and is uh, more common in, in Europe and the United Kingdom. White powder is typically injected, it's not easy to smoke, uh, whereas the uh, brown powder is far more amenable to smoking, which means you see higher rates of heroin smoking in the United Kingdom and Europe. And by smoking, I typically mean what's known as chasing the dragon where people put heroin on foil and use a lighter underneath it and then chase the vapour with a straw. Let's look also, however, at some other drugs that are used for pain management. As I said, analgesia is one of the cardinal um, effects of these drugs. And also for treating opioid dependence, Buprenorphine is a partial um, agonist, uh, uh, an antagonist, and it's used for the substitution of, for heroin in, the tr in opioid substitution treatment. It's also prescribed for pain. It can be given as a sublingual tablet, film, a patch, or a depot uh, formulation has recently been developed where a uh, it is inserted under the skin and there's a gradual release of the drug. This has been recently trialled in delivery for uh, opioid substitution treatment. The advantage of buprenorphine is that because it has antagonist properties, it's safer in overdose. Uh, you can overdose, of course, from any opioid, but uh, its respiratory depressive effects are substantially less than drugs like heroin or methadone. Speaking of methadone, methadone has traditionally been the major form of opiate substitution, although this is changing, buprenorphine is becoming more common. It's given in syrup or tablet form, but it can also be prescribed for pain. Um, it is unsurprisingly, you know, it's an opioid and it's a long-acting opioid. The reason that buprenorphine and methadone are given as substitution is because they're long-acting drugs. So they can have daily dosing or even with the case of buprenorphine, less than daily dosing and maintain uh, blood levels of the opioid and thus reduce craving. And it's been shown beyond question this reduces the rates of um, use of heroin uh, during treatment and reduces the risk of death and reduces criminality. Oxycodone is something that's been of major interest since the turn of the century. Uh, it's prescribed for pain, can come in tablet form, uh, but it's also uh, been a drug that has, particularly in North America, exploded in terms of its misuse and illicit use. I should point out that drugs such as oxycodone can be injected. Uh, ditto for methadone and buprenorphine and this is obviously with higher degrees of harm. Uh, the North American opioid epidemic has been overwhelmingly fueled by uh, the increased prescribing and use of oxycodone and oxycodone related deaths have increased dramatically in North America in the last 20 years. Finally fentanyl uh, prescribed for pain, uh, common, uh, quite often in patch form. Fentanyl is highly potent. It's a very dangerous drug if used um, illicitly or misused. People do things like soak the patches and inject the active fentanyl. I should point out its, it's risk for mortality is substantially higher than other opioids. Uh, when you look at an opioid related death and look at morphine, which as I said is what's seen in the blood of, of people who use heroin, uh, 
you would see a typical concentration of about 0.2 milligrams per litre. In a fentanyl related death it's far more likely to look like something like 0.01 milligrams per litre. Very small doses of this drug can result in profound respiratory depression and death. Let's now look at opioid toxicity. Toxicity is for this class of drugs the major cause of harm. It's not the only cause of harm but it's the major concern here. Whereas other drug classes we look at a range of effects on the body. This is less pronounced for the opioids although there is, there is the case that, that such effects do occur. Toxicity is the major concern here. What do we mean by opioid toxicity? Well, firstly, let's look at the diagnostic triad that's used to diagnose such toxicity, acute toxicity. Firstly, depressed respiration rate. This can be down to the order of four breaths a minute. And there can be a cascading down of slower and slower respiration through to a coma and death. And this reduced respiration can be quite prolonged even after the uh, concentrations of opioids are of reducing in the blood it can be prolonged. I should point out that even among people who are highly tolerant to these drugs they can show these effects and it's been shown amongst heroin users who are highly tolerant that their breath can go down to something like four a minute. I think we need to keep in mind that one of the things we do know about the uh, opioid tolerance and its dependence is tolerance to the euphoric effects increases quite rapidly. Tolerance to the respiratory depression increases far more slowly. So people use more of the drug because they need to use more to get high but their tolerance to those breathing effects hasn't increased at the same rate and you can see that therefore there's as use escalates in that situation there's an increased risk of respiratory depression. Second one is meiosis. I mentioned it before, pinpoint pupils, a cardinal sign to look for if you suspect someone of having acute opioid toxicity and a reduced level of consciousness. Uh, this can go in from um, profound sleepiness through to coma and uh, as I said a cascading effect towards death. Now there are other signs of opioid toxicity that are of clinical significance here. First is the aspiration of vomit. Uh, aspiration of vomit is a frequently a seen occurrence in opioid overdose and is common in, in opioid related death. I said to you earlier the opioids actually cause vomiting they reduce the, uh, the cough reflex to clear it and it's inhaled into the lungs. It's very difficult to treat and it's a major um, uh, clinical issue and a major um, emergency requiring immediate medical attention. Cyanosis, a lack of oxygen. This is a result of the uh, respiratory depression that we've focused on so far. And this can be commonly seen in lips turning blue. This is, if someone's lips are turning blue, this is a sign that there's a, a, a major clinical issue happening. They need immediate intervention. Snoring. This may be one that people don't think about. And I'm not saying that everyone who snores has got acute opioid toxicity. What is known, however, is that it is a sign of respiratory distress in this situation. I've lost count of the number of cases of fatalities that I've read where the witnesses said the decedent that was snoring, I knew they was okay because they were snoring. They were in respiratory distress, they were overdosing, they were dying. And if you've got someone laying on their, black, on their back snoring and they've got aspiration of vomiting, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, for someone who's been using opioids, snoring, they need to be kept an eye on. It can cause a slow heart rate, uh, bradycardia. This is the opposite of drugs that we see, for instance, with the stimulants, which increase heart rate. It can cause low blood pressure, 
uh, hypotension. Again, this is the opposite that we see with the stimulants. And it can cause hypothermia, uh, low body temperature. All of these things are the opposite of stimulants. They all have major clinical effects. The main cause of death in this case is uh, respiratory collapse. As I said, the brain has forgot to tell the body to breathe and you shouldn't underestimate the effects of aspiration pneumonia. So you've got people with um, reduced respiratory rate and they're inhaling vomit. And I should point out that the rates of lung disease, emphysema amongst opioid users and heroin users in particular are high because there's very high levels of smoking. So you've got people with little um, respiratory reserve using a drug, reducing their uh, respiration and eventually this can result in total cessation. The wonderful thing about opioids in terms of toxicity and intervention is that it is easily reversed by naloxone. Naloxone hydrochloride, or sometimes in some marketed as Narcan. This is the antidote, shall I say. Um, it's an antagonist to the opioids. It competes with the opioid for occupation of the receptors. It knocks them off the, those receptors and you get very, very rapid recovery. And this is available in both injectable form when it can be injected by um, um, intramuscular. And there are now nasal preparations, which uh, all of these have shown to be effective. Uh, my advice would be for anyone who's using opioids or around people who are using opioids is to have Narcan or Naloxone around. And if you're a medical practitioner prescribing opioids or treating someone with opioid dependence, I would strongly advise co-prescribing of Naloxone. Uh, it's widely available and in many countries now is an over-the-counter drug. And, uh, if anyone is using opioids, this is an antidote that is there. It may require more than one dose. People will need to be monitored, but it's a highly effective intervention. To further explore toxicity of opioids, one thing I think I need to make quite clear is that the majority of opioid overdoses also involve the use of other drugs. This is actually typical of, of drug overdose more generally. It reflects the fact that most substance users um, and in oh, certainly illicit opioid users are polydrug users. The person who just uses one illicit substance is vanishingly rare and this has real clinical significance. The two drug classes of major concern here are alcohol and the benzodiazepines. Now what I'm going to say is typical of both fatal and non-fatal overdose. Alcohol uh, is present in up to half of these cases and sometimes in quite significant amounts. It's a CNS depressant and interacting with another CNS depressant, an opioid such as heroin or indeed illicit opioid such as oxycodone, increases the risk of respiratory depression and death. Both of these drugs you, uh, cause respiratory depression putting them together increases the risk of, of, an, of toxicity. The other one are the benzodiazepines or hypnosedatives, drugs such as diazepam or the Z-class hypnotics like zolpidem. The use of these drugs again with, with, with opioids is dangerous because they again are CNS depressants. Now, of course, there can be responsible use of these drugs, and they all have legitimate clinical purposes, uh, the benzodiazepines, but there has to be a degree of clinical concern about the, the amount being used, and benzodiazepines have dependence potential. Now, the issue here is that the use of any one of these drugs may not have caused an overdose. So you, that they use them all together, and the use of those three together is 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 uh, is common amongst, particularly amongst illicit users or abusers of these drugs. The level of each and every one of them may not have killed the person, but if you put them all together, the additive effects of the respiratory depression can result in in, in respiratory failure. 
So we need to think in terms of multiple drug use when we think of risk. And in terms of prescribing, this needs to be um, kept in mind. Accidental overdose is in fact the major cause of the high mortality rate I referred to amongst opioid users. Most of overdoses, something like 95%, are accidental. There are overdoses that are suicides, intentional, but almost all overdoses are unintentional. And the reason I want to emphasise that is that uh, it is sometimes thought that overdoses are merely a, um, a parasuicides. They're just they're actually a form of suicide. There's certainly no evidence for that. And they're not random events. We know what, what causes the increased risk for accidental overdose, more frequent use, uh, poly drug use, returning to use after a period of abstinence. These are all increased risks. But while there are high rates of depression amongst opioid users and those dependent on opioid users, their opioid overdoses are overwhelmingly unintentional. Now we shouldn't just focus on deaths. Um, for every fatality, there are something like 25 to 50 near misses. That has real implications, um, which I'll talk about, but they have implications um, in terms of uh, it's a predictor of a later overdose. So if you overdose in one year, you're something like nine times more likely to overdose in the next year. And it's a predictor of later overdose fatality. Now, how common is this uh, phenomenon of non-fatal overdose? Typically, something like 50% of heroin users, for example, report at least one um, overdose. And we see figures that are not as high, but have occurred um, at higher levels than we would expect amongst, for instance, chronic pain patients who are uh, prescribed opioids, where you will find that something like 15% will have a history of an overdose. Let's move on to looking at the opioids uh, in their relationship to the brain. There are a number of issues that relate to what we've discussed. Uh, firstly, there is evidence, good evidence, of higher rates of acquired brain injury amongst opioid users. Now, I should point out the opioids are not neurotoxic. They're not in and of themselves destroying brain cells. What they do do, however, is reduce oxygenation to the brain. And thus, in overdoses, and I talked about the high rates of non-fatal overdoses, quite often the responses are terrible, particularly amongst uh, illicit users. People will do things like put people in the shower. Um, they'll do anything other than, and cause pain to them, anything other than call an ambulance for fear of police involvement. But putting someone in a shower means you've got someone who's wet and overdosed rather than dry and overdosed. What they need is naloxone or oxygenation. They need ventilating. But because responses are so poor in quite a number of cases, you get anoxic brain damage. That is damage, diffuse damage to the brain from prolonged periods of uh, reduced oxygenation. Another one is traumatic head injury. Uh, amongst illicit users, it's a violent life and there's a high rates of of uh, violence inflicted upon heroin users. Uh, in, you've got to, talking about uh, drugs and money. Uh, it's a recipe for violence and that's what we see. And traumatic head injuries are significantly higher amongst um, this, this population. There another result can cause of head injuries. I use the term dropping that someone can overdose and literally drop down on unconscious onto a footpath and uh, uh, have a head injury as a result. What this has meant is that there's actually poorer cognitive function amongst regular opioid users, particularly I'm talking primarily here about people who misuse opioids. 
I should emphasise that those who are using opioids for, for instance, pain relief, etc., within recognised level and monitored medically, this is substantially lower risk of these effects. But having said that, the person who's using a drug like oxycodone and also drinking alcohol and taking benzodiazepines is at risk of these effects. The core cognitive functioning is very wide ranging. It covers executive functioning, that is planning, um, uh, etc., uh, verbal and nonverbal uh, learning. Uh, information processing is slowed. The sorts of things we expect to see from acquired brain injury. There is one sp specific thing um, that we've seen related to heroin smoking or chasing the dragon uh, is heroin-induced heroin uh, leukoencephalopathy, which is demyelination of neurons. Uh, this is caused specifically, we think, uh, by the inhaling uh, the uh, aluminium foil. It, it's the foil is heated and you're inhaling the product of that inhalation of that, um, you're inhaling that as well as you're inhaling the um, vaporised heroin. Let's now move on to the lungs. There are a few effects to discuss here. I've mentioned repeatedly uh, the uh, aspiration pneumonia. I won't go in, in detail again here. However, as I've said, opioids are rheumatics. They cause vomiting and they repress um, coughing. And once that vomit is inhaled into the lungs, uh, it's something that requires urgent medical treatment. Heroin snorting has been associated in some cases with sudden onset of asthma attacks. Uh, and heroin chasing, uh, chasing the dragon, has also been shown to be associated with um, asthma attacks. These are rare events, but they do occur. Uh, smoking has certainly been associated with impaired lung function and elevated rates of early onset emphysema. And I should point out also that if you were looking at heroin users in particular, almost all heroin users smoke cigarettes as well. But these are known effects of the opioids and it's a route of administration issue here with things with heroin smoking. Let's now briefly discuss opioids in the kidneys. Now opioids are not nephrotoxic, that is they do not cause direct damage to the kidneys. But there are reasons why opioid users might have effects on, on their kidneys. The high rates of non-fatal overdose I've referred to have implications for the kidneys. First is rhabdomyolysis, crush syndrome. The person lies on the limb unconscious for a prolonged period of time, uh, reducing the, um, the blood to the limb, causing muscle breakdown which releases myoglobin uh, into the bloodstream. That is deleterious, can kill kidney cells and cause acute kidney failure. So what we have here is not so much a direct toxicity, but yet another example of opioid toxicity and the effects of opioid overdose upon other systems in the body. And the liver. Again, the opioids are not hepatotoxic, that is, they do not directly kill liver cells. But if you're a clinician treating someone with opioid dependence, and particularly an injecting opioid user, you're likely to see significant liver disease among such patients. Firstly, because of needle sharing, very high rates of hepatitis C and hepatitis B viruses. Uh, this causes progressive um, liver damage and can result in fibrosis, cirrhosis and carcinoma. Also high rates of alcohol dependence amongst the illicit um, in users in particular. While there's a higher proportion of such populations don't drink because it's not their main game, there's a higher proportion than the general population who drink heavily. As I've said, that has implications for overdose, but it also has implications for alcohol um, caused liver disease. And finally, uh, 
users who inject uh, tablets such as grinding up oxycodone tablets, which is one of the major clinical issues of the last 20 years, tr tablet uh, preparations can cause uh, right-sided heart failure, which can cause chronic uh, congestion of the liver with a form of uh, cirrhosis and liver failure. The heart, again, they're not cardiotoxic. Unlike drugs such as the stimulants, which do cause direct harm to the heart, this is not the case with the opioids, but a clinician treating someone with um, opioid dependence is likely to see uh, increased uh, risk factors for them. Firstly, I mentioned the high smoking rates, particularly amongst the illicit users. Um, this has direct effects upon um, an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Alcohol dependence causes chronic uh, hypertension and can cause cardiovascular disease. And I mentioned injection of tablet preparations can cause right-sided heart failure. Again, we're not talking about direct effects of the opioid killing heart muscle cells, but risk factors associated with the use of these drugs. Uh, let's look at a range of other conditions which we know are related to opioids. Uh, firstly, teeth. Opioid users have more missing teeth and poorer dental health. Now, at one level, uh, illicit opioid users aren't necessarily uh, getting regular dental health uh, checkups and uh, maybe not keeping their teeth in the best order, but there are direct effects of the opioids. They retard saliva production, increasing the risk of bacteria, and thus we see poorer dent dental health amongst these users when they're saying that the drugs are uh, affecting their teeth. They are. And to be honest, I think this is an under-researched and under-considered issue. We talk a lot about comorbidity and rightly so about psychiatric comorbidity and the issues related there. But I think we need to talk about dental health because dental health has major implications for a person's general well-being as well as their mental health. There are gastrointestinal effects, decreased motility in the gastrointestinal tract cause constipation or even complete uh, blockage of the bowel. And nausea and vomiting uh, are common effects. Nausea, particularly for new users of drugs, of the opioids, is a common effect. Uh, the vomiting has issues, of course, regular vomiting causes dental problems, but there is the issue of vomiting in the, uh, in the circumstance of, of overdose. And finally, the musculature crush syndrome, that is the, the uh, destruction of muscle tissue from prolonged unconsciousness lying on an arm or a leg, not moving, uh, can cause permanent damage to those muscles and requires surgical intervention. Well, as you can see from that presentation, the major concern regarding the opioids is toxicity. Not the only concern, but it is a major concern given the sheer number of deaths we see from the opioids. That has also, as you have seen, has knock-on effects to a range of other sy uh, systems in the body. Now, these have been a lot of complex issues I've raised. Uh, you can see full details in this book we published in uh, 2021. The Pocket Guide to Drugs and Health, in that we look at each of the drug classes and each of the major organ systems and its page at a glance format. If you want to know what the major effects of a drug upon the kidneys, for example, you open up the page and it'll be there uh, in dot point or very straightforward, um, informative language. I thank you all for your attention.